Hi, everyone. I just wanted to quickly introduce our next topic, and we're going to have um, a few speakers come up and talk about some of our educational efforts. Um, so first, we have um, a project that Alfred mentioned briefly, um, Android App Inventor, or Young Android, um, done by visiting faculty Hal Abelson and Ellen Spurtis. And I'll just go through everything quickly and let everyone go one after another. Um, and then Mitch Resnick is here, and I asked him to briefly talk about uh, CS4HS um, and the workshop that was held at MIT recently. Um, and then finally, Obi Greenberg will be talking about uh, YouTube, EDU, and um, educational efforts there. So, thank you. Is it on? It's on. Yes, okay. you're good. Okay. Hi, I'm Hal Abelson, and I'm here with Ellen Spurtis. And as Alfred mentioned this morning, we're both visiting faculty here, and uh, it's just great. I guess the one thing I wanted to say about visiting faculty to all of you is the very high, when you, in the culture here, the very highest status thing you can be is an engineer. So I think some of you know what it's like to be doing some sort of computer science thing, say, in a, in a large medical research center, right? And you know that you have no class. Everyone will say, well, here's this great thing you've done. You know, you've, you've, you've proved P equals, NP, P equals NP, but what do the doctors think? And at Google, it's always, what do the engineers think? And it's just wonderful, wonderful culture to be in. Anyway, what we're working on, we're part of what's called the Young Android Group, and we're building a uh, programming platform called App Inventor. And App Inventor is inspired by two observations. The first one is that there is a real discontinuity that probably started about two years ago and may go on for another two years about what it means, what it can mean to experience computation. It's like in 1980 when suddenly there was a discontinuity and computing could have something to do with, with graphics for most people. Uh, Larry talked about computer science not being sexy, so I, I won't get myself in trouble by trying to talk about sex, but what computer science is right now is dissociated. And the difference between the, the, the revolution we're going through right now is that computing no longer has to be on abstract things that are going on or deep concepts like what's the difference between a private class and a protected class in Java, but it can be about your life and the way you walk around and interact with you. That's happening right now. That's one phenomenon. The other one is that Google is building Android, which is open source. So if you see the great things that's happening in all sorts of mobile phones, it's tremendous and there are lots of applications, but they're being viewed as consumer products. Right? Not only are they unclosed architectures, but you need, Steve's you need Steve Jobs' permission in order to distribute your application. And the great opportunity is that there are now open source mobile platforms that can link to the web, that can link to your social networks. And what I'm going to show you is a very quick demo where we've said, what would it be like if it were really easy to make mobile applications? So let me, let me start with one. I'll show you a hello world in this system. Here's a little application. Let's start it. There's the kitty. And pet the kitty. <laughs> okay, that's... Okay, that's, that actually is my cat. Here's a little application. Now go to the next. Go to the next one. Okay, so this is an online developing app. This is an online development environment, and what you see here are a, a palette, a suite of applications that you can add to your phone. And these things are boxed up as what we call components. And so here. What we're going to do is we just grabbed out a label that's going to be the label that says pet the kitty. And there on the right, over here, there are the properties that you can play with of this label. And we're changing the text of the label to say pet the kitty. And we're just for fun, we're going to change the font size of the label to be larger. And uh, And I guess that's all. Oh, no, we'll change the background color of the label to be something and the text color to be something. Okay. 
Okay, so this is a little bit like, like the standard kinds of graphical interfaces you see. Okay, now what we're going to do is pull out another component, which is a button. So that's going to be the button that you press in order to make something happen. And uh, we're going to tell this button to look like, right, we're going to grab its image and say this button should look like a picture of my cat. So there we have a very primitive, you see this isn't uh, making a faithful rendition of what's on the screen. So you have to uh, push another tab to actually see what it's going to look like on the screen. But we're getting there. This is a work very much in progress. Okay. And now, remember when you uh, pet the kitty, it's supposed to go meow. So you need a meow. So there's another component, which is uh, a sound player. We're going to tell the sound player that the sound you play is the kitty meow. Okay, so there's the way our application looks. So the model in this is you, you set something up for how it should look on the screen, and then you're going to put the logic in. All right, so the logic of this program, for those of you who've seen uh, Alice or even more scratch. This will look very, very familiar. In fact, I, this project owes a tremendous amount to Mitch Resnick and scratch. And we're actually going to ask Mitch to talk in a minute. So what you see here, now we're doing the logic. So you see all of your components here, and we're going to drag out from the button a thing that says what you do when the button's clicked. All right, so there's our event handler for the button. We're going to say, when the button's clicked, you tell the sound to play. And then just for fun, we're going to make the cat purr. So we're also going to, uh, to say when the button's clicked, you tell the sound to vibrate the phone. Right, so this, is, this comes from scratch. And like Alice, this sort of puzzle piece code blocks version of putting things together. And we're going to tell it to uh, vibrate for 500 milliseconds, half a second. Okay, So that's the complete application. And then what you do when you've built this application is you, uh, you say compile it. It builds a complete ordinary application and then puts up a barcode. And then you can download this thing to the phone over the barcode. All right, so that's hello world. But of course, let's see, how do I stop this thing? That's cool. It's coming up here. Uh, how do I get out here? Okay. But of course, the interesting thing is not that you can put pictures of cats, but this is actually a phone. So here's another application that's done the same way, except this time, when you press the button, it's going to make a phone call. And it's also linked to your data on the phone. So when you say add somebody, it goes to the contact picker on your phone and picks out the contacts, which is where it's getting the pictures and the phone numbers from. And of course, the phone is also location sensitive. Here's a tiny, tiny little application where you push the button that says, where am I? And it tells you your latitude and longitude, which should not be surprising because the phone does that. But this is the program. Right? And here's a more complicated program that actually is kind of like a game of telephone, because the phones can, of course, talk to each other over, over the web and talk to web servers. And this talks to a little web service that maintains a group. And you play a little game. So that's sort of an, an image of where we're going. Uh, we are, this project is in development. And the thing that's interesting about this project is that it's kind of done collaboratively with a bunch of universities. So we're experimenting with about a dozen universities in the fall. And this will evolve. Uh, 
We may take on more in the spring. All of us on the young Android team will be around at the cocktail party and the dinner if you want to talk about what you might do. But let me introduce Ellen now, who is not only a visiting faculty member at Google, but also going to use this in about uh, three weeks at Mills. Uh, thanks, Hal. Um, uh, Hal mentioned a great thing about Google is that the engineers are the most important, and that's true. Another great thing is the egalitarianism. Uh, it doesn't matter where you come from, what degree you have. Uh, everybody's code gets reviewed. And one of my biggest thrills was getting to review Hal's code and finding an abstraction violation. <laughs> so Mills College is a women's liberal arts college nearby in Oakland, California. Uh, it's not an engineering school. What our students care most about is justice, social change. Um, they're usually protesting something. I know all of you are familiar with this graph. Those of you who um, don't teach at women's colleges may not have focused as much on this number. The latest statistics are that only three out of a thousand college freshmen women want to major in computer science. So imagine you're at a school that is fewer than a thousand undergrads. So uh, it's important to attract other students and um, you know, that would be true even if a lot of people were interested in computer science, because my goal for this goes beyond students. Um, in some parts of the world, the people's only internet access is through their phones. And if we can make it so non-computer scientists can create phone apps, that can have a huge effect. So I'm teaching a class um, this fall called Technology for a Better World. And the idea is the students um, usually see their cell phones and technology used for entertainment or commerce, but it can also be used to change the world. So uh, with Kiva, uh, that supports microfinance between the developed and developing world. Um, one laptop per child could have a huge effect. Um, WikiLeaks, that lets people anonymously upload documents to fight corruption. Uh, by government and local officials and corporations. And um, as I said, cell phones are having a huge effect on the developing world. I was pleased to see there's an ICT group. Um, and I think that I'm hoping that this will appeal to students. So I'm going to start with uh, Hale's Kitty application. And the next assignment can just ask students to make small changes to that and make a better application. Because whenever you see something, you think, uh, how would I have done it? What don't I like about it? How can I make it better? So um, take American Idol. You could create one button for each of the contestants, and you press a button, and it calls and votes for that person. Um, Hal mentioned the location sensor. Uh, you can make it so you go somewhere, and it shows a picture relevant to it. Um, uh, there's there's so many things. You can make it uh, play a video when you go to a location, press a button. Uh, imagine that when you're going around a museum or walking along uh, a historical trail. So there are really few limits of what you can do. So that would be introducing the students to the technology, but the term project would be to design an application that can help people who aren't being well served by technology and uh, either implement it or create a prototype over the semester. So I hope th that uh, students will understand better what computer science is about, which is valuable even if they don't go on to take more computer science courses. Um, see that computer science is about helping people and think about technology. Uh, some of you know the Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility old uh, slogan, technology is driving the future. It's up to us to do the steering. Uh, so with that, I'll turn things over to Mitch. As Alfred mentioned this morning, Google has been supporting this initiative called CS for HS to support uh, computer science at the high school level. So um, I talked with Leslie earlier uh, in the year about MIT getting involved in this. And we ended up this past, just a few weeks ago, running our first CS for HS, 
When I first started talking to Leslie about it, I said I really was excited about participating in CSVHS, but just with a couple small caveats. The first caveat was I really didn't think it should just be about high school, but to me it seemed important to get started earlier on. So I wanted to stretch it so it's not just high school, but also middle school, even elementary school teachers, because these ideas felt important enough. It was important to get young people started early. And the other small problem was I didn't think it was exactly right to focus on computer science. Uh, so was CS for HS was fine, except for the CS and the HS. And what I meant by you know, the CS was at least the way people traditionally think about CS in, in pre-college, where they think about the AP course uh, to prepare people who are going to major in CS and then may become computer science professionals. And I have nothing, no problem with that. But in my mind, it's important to reach everybody, as, some, as, as Alan and Hal were also mentioning, that these ideas are important for everybody, regardless of what they major in or, or what they do. And luckily, Google was supportive enough to say, yes, go for it, and to try to stretch it in both those directions, to reach a broader audience about teachers at all different levels, and to think about how computational ideas can reach you know, people of, of all different areas of interest and see how they could apply it in all different areas. So in fact, it gets captured somewhat in the subtitle of what we called our workshop. We said it was cultivating computational thinking and computational creativity in the classroom. So it's drawing on Jeanette Wing's ideas about computational thinking, about there's certain core ideas that are important for thinking in all different disciplines, and also computational creativity, about enabling people to create things computationally. And our main approach to this workshop it was not about having a bunch of teachers come in and listen to lectures about computational ideas for several days. It was much more focused on learning through designing, to get everybody involved in designing and creating you know, with computers, because we found the best way for learning is actually by creating things on your own. And it was really towards this end of trying to help people develop a fluency with computational media, that when we see it clearly, there's so many people, especially the next generation growing up, are very comfortable with going and interacting with computers in all sorts of ways, but very, very few have what I would call a fluency. And again, with the analogy to reading and writing, we don't say someone is fluent with language if they can just read a street sign, but you know, it's only if they can write. We want people to be able to you know, write, even if they're not gonna become you know, professional journalists or authors, but to be able to either write a report, to be able to write a, a shopping list, to write a, a note to a friend. Computation, we don't expect the same things, and we should, to let everybody really become fluent to their creating. So that was our real goal is to help support these teachers to then support students to become truly fluent where they can create their own dynamic interactive media. So not just interacting, but designing, creating with computational media. So for doing that, we really were basing it on our Scratch software, which Hal mentioned. So this is software which we've developed over the last few years with support from the National Science Foundation and then more recently from others, where our goal was, we think one of the reasons that, that programming hasn't, you know, you know, that most people aren't programming is partly you know, we need to make programming more accessible, more meaningful, and more social. By more accessible, we want to make it so that, get rid of some of the syntax which gets in the way, make it easier. So it's this building block metaphor, as Hal mentioned. Uh, so you can just start building up programs as easily as putting different blocks or jigsaw pi uh, puzzle pieces together. So you can get to the core ideas more quickly. More meaningful, letting people do things that they care about. Again, as Hal was saying, too much of a computer is dissociated. Make it where people can build things they really care about. Again, here we were doing a lot of things with giving access to media, to manipulate media, manipulate images, photographs, music, sound, and put together in different ways. And also more social, to be able to share your, uh, what you've created. So right when the application, Scratch application, became available two years ago, we also launched a website uh, where you can very easily, just by clicking on the share button at the top of the interface, your project immediately goes to the website. So right now on the Scratch website, there's a new project coming up more than one a minute. There's now more than 500,000 projects shared by kids on this website. So it's a type of YouTube for interactive media. Uh, so instead of sharing videos, you share your own dynamic interactive creations. Uh, so there's all different types of things on the website, art, music, stories, robotics, uh, simulations, games. So people do things all different ways and then share a tremendous, and then do all types of collaboration sharing more than 20% of the uploads are remixes of one another, where people download, take the code of someone else's projects and add it. So again, at the CS for HS workshop we did, it was helping the teachers learn to support these types of activities using the Scratch software. Let me just show you briefly some of the types of projects 
uh, that the teachers were working on. So these are from the workshop. So again, this is the scratch programming language, the application where you just snap blocks together to make different things happen. Uh, let me show you, this, this was a product I'll put in, well, I'll just start playing it. So this was like an introductory project. We asked them to just do something, use images to introduce people to the workshop. So here again, someone here with mixing, they took a picture of their daughter, put it on the dancing body, took a photograph from the media lab and made this little welcome. So it's again, mixing lots of different media together in order to do this little, sort of welcome animation. Uh, but in the process, learn to think creatively, uh, you know, reason systematically by putting these blocks together in different ways. So you can actually see, you can also say it's very tinkerable. You just take this away. So this is the part that says forever change costume. If I do that, that's making this character dance around. Let me just show one more example from later in the workshop. When they were sort of experimenting with games, uh, this was a project, we'll put it in full screen mode here. So this was a game that one of the teachers created. Uh, that's, I'm now hitting the arrow keys to move the character back and forth and they can launch the fork trying to get healthy foods. Yummy. So if I hit good food, I sort of gain points. If I hit uh, less healthy food. Yucky. So again, not so much that this is you know, the greatest game of all times, but th the idea is, again, to sort of be able to just very quickly put together, but to learn core computational ideas as you put together these different means of personal expression. So through these different types of projects, you know, I think what we were seeing was, is partly to get people learning some core computational concepts, everything from conditionals, variables, synchronization, threads, event handling, all come about, you know, but in a very, very clear, clear way. We found that it's much better for introducing these core concepts. In fact, that even though we designed this for eight to 15 year olds, a number of universities are starting to use it in the first few weeks of computer science classes because it's a good way to get these concepts very clearly of course, across or, for, or even for a whole semester, you know, oftentimes for non-computer science majors. So part of our idea was to get these core concepts across, but also to develop problem solving capacities and putting these programs together, design capacities, defending also just socio-emotional capacities about collaborating, sharing, persevering with, during frustration. So it wasn't just about learning core computer science concepts, the ideas of how to sort of address difficult challenges and problem solving and, and design and learning how to go about doing that. So again, we were really excited about you know, the results from it. We had a group of teachers who we got very positive feedback at the end about how they can make use of this in their classes in a variety of different ways in K through 12. And we're excited about continuing to work with Google in the years ahead to, to see how we can support this in, in, a, in a broader way. Thanks a lot. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Obadiah Greenberg. I'm wor I work on the strategic partnerships team at YouTube. I'm here to talk to you today about YouTube EDU. Um, I know we're a little uh, pressed for time, so I'm gonna breeze through some of these first slides, but I uh, really just wanted to set the stage with YouTube about uh, YouTube's mission in that uh, I think what differentiated it when uh, it launched a number of years ago is that really the community decides, meaning that it's the community it, it's a complete meritocracy. The community decides what videos are the most popular, uh, which ones they want to engage in, and therefore uh, make it to the home page. Uh, and you'll see that this same ethic is uh, carried over to what we're doing with our higher education partners. Uh, just a general sense of scope, uh, hundreds of millions of views uh, daily, hundreds of thousands of uploads daily. And I bet you if I asked how many of you folks have seen a YouTube video, it'd probably be pretty much everyone. Uh, uh, upload, probably a few less. Um, and uh, again, just a sense of scope is uh, there are now 20 hours of video being uploaded every minute, which is something. Uh, and so, you know, in uh, this kind of ocean of uh, video, um, I want to talk about what we're doing to really help surface the uh, incredible higher education video that's uh, coming on onto YouTube. Uh, so, you know, a lot of folks, when you think of YouTube, even today, still think of Lonely Girl you know, 15 or, uh, you know, cats playing piano, things like that. Uh, we're hoping that myth has been dispelled over the last couple of years with some of the important partnerships we've struck with folks like the BBC, the, the You Choose campaign, uh, and so on. Uh, but it was a couple of years ago that uh, we formed our first official partnership with uh, uh, higher, higher Education uh, University. This is UC Berkeley's channel came out. You uh, 
might have heard about it, made quite a splash, uh, primarily because they uh, were putting up so much video. I think it was about 150 videos to, at start, but a number of those videos were course lectures, all the lectures that make up a semester, uh, a semester. So essentially we're doing course casting and not just making it available for their community, but for a worldwide audience. Uh, since then, we've struck, uh, uh, we have relationships with a number of, uh, of colleges and universities in the U.S., Canada, and actually around the world. Uh, we, uh, there are actually hundreds of schools now who have an official presence on YouTube. Uh, so then we realized that, okay, we have all of these uh, great college and university partners, but uh, folks are still having a hard time finding them. And the schools are saying, you know, we really want to be among our peers. So we have some stated goals for a project called YouTube EDU to help showcase these, these partnerships. So one is just to promote the discovery of this uh, incredible uh, video on YouTube uh, and, and to showcase it in a way that we felt was new and exciting. Uh, so the ability to see kind of what channels are the most popular, what videos are the most popular, and start to detect some trends as to why. Uh, to build a community of peers, again, these schools are kind of depending on, on if they're rivals or not, or colleagues, whatever. They sort of see how they, um, how their popularity is are relative to the others, and it's not even necessarily a factor of the, the quality of the video itself, as much as what are the, what are the savvy ways they're using to promote those videos on their site and elsewhere. And then finally, provide a platform for reach and tool for research. So we already talked about reach in terms of uh, just kind of the, the, the size of the audience uh, in, uh, in the world who are watching YouTube, but also tools for research being a lot of the analytics we provide about, about the videos, which I'll touch on in, in a later slide. So this is YouTube EDU. This is just a screenshot. You can find it at youtube.com slash edu. And essentially what we have here are, uh, by default, the most viewed videos and the most viewed channels. And then you can click in to kind of drill down in, in, in subsequent pages. Uh, it's fascinating to watch this on a daily basis and see some videos start to kind of jump up into the most viewed slots. Um, and uh, there are also some other interesting uh, um, things that are fairly unique to YouTube EDU that the rest of YouTube, YouTube doesn't have. So uh, one is, well, right here we have just a pure directory of all of the schools. So uh, if you're interested in uh, posting your lectures or tutorials, or whatever you might be interested in posting, uh, and you want it to be part of your university's program, go to the directory first and see if your school is already part of YouTube EDU. Uh, if they're not, then you know talk to the appropriate people uh, on your campus, uh, the kind of AV folks or public relations folks. Uh, and it's also possible that they have a channel that is in development but just has not been added to the directory yet. Uh, this is just a shot of uh, our most viewed uh, videos. This is, I think, maybe a month old, this screenshot. Um, and uh, this is also an interesting feature of YouTube EDU where you can actually search within the YouTube EDU corpus. This is a search on physics, and you're getting just physics, anything with physics and the metadata from the schools that are providing uh, a video to YouTube. Uh, we have a lot of MIT and Berkeley and Stanford here. Uh, these are the most subscribed channel. <clears throat> a subscription means that a, a viewer uh, is watching the video and they say, I want to subscribe, so anything new that one of these schools posts comes into my inbox because I want to stay up on what this provider is, is posting. <clears throat> What's interesting about this slide is you'll see the most subscribed, and again, this is about a month old, it might have changed, but uh, MIT, Berkeley, Stanford, and this is actually IIT, uh, these schools are all posting um, not just news clips, not just uh, kind of public affairs clips, but full courses. So this tells us, hey, the YouTube community and people in the world are really appreciating and valuing this open content and this, these open educational resources that these schools are making available. So these are just some screenshots of some of the courses that are being made available. From Berkeley has about, I think, a dozen. Of course, they have many more on their own local site. Uh, MIT is uh, up to, I think, about 50, uh, you know, range of topics. Uh, here we have Stanford, another range of topics. Uh, and IIT, which a lot of people don't realize that they have um, about over 100 full courses engineering courses on their YouTube channel right now. It's quite amazing. And uh, what's also interesting about most of the schools that are posting open courseware is it does tend to be primarily engineering computer science. 
uh, oh, and can't forget uh, Kyoto University either. And what's interesting is now, you know, you're really seeing that we have uh, open courseware. It's a global movement. Uh, uh, you know, globally, these schools are forming uh, uh, YouTube channels. And uh, what's nice is that with YouTube, it's not all about people having to go to YouTube to see this stuff or go to the YouTube channels, but also that with the embedding function, you know, a little snippet of code, uh, people can add these videos to their local websites. So here's the famous last lecture at Carnegie Mellon. I think when this thing first went viral, Oprah talked about it or something like that, I think there were some issues with supporting all the viewership uh, locally. They posted it to YouTube, embedded the video on their page, and uh, I've been happy ever since. Uh, and this is, of course, MIT's OpenCourseWare site, which uh, they've started now to replace their old real player, where people had to kind of often download a plug-in and so on and so on to see this video. Now, right in line, their lectures are playing. Uh, what's also interesting, I mentioned some of the analytics tools. I know this is small, but these are two of the uh, more popular videos uh, in YouTube EDU today, uh, one IIT and MIT. And, uh, you know, as, as an instructor, uh, you can actually see uh, some of the trends of viewership, how people are arriving at these videos, uh, where they're being linked from, where they're being embedded from, and so on. So there's amazing analytics around each of these videos. You can get a sense of, you know, th in a particular time frame, uh, who, is, uh, who is watching from where. And what's also interesting is you can also find out what parts of a video, so we're talking maybe an hour lecture, you can find out what parts of a video the YouTube community are, are interested in relative to other videos uh, of this duration. You know, you drag the slider around and you see a dip here where it goes kind of more above average, and then you can analyze that and say, okay, what is it about this part of the lecture that people are finding interesting, right? So it's like a great feedback. It's like the world's biggest focus group or something. Uh, another interesting feature, actually Yale has come up big with starting to post uh, full courses, which is awesome. Uh, this is a literature course. This is uh, a, um, the lecture looks like it's on, on the road. And uh, when captions are made available, we do support captions. We have a feature called auto-translate. And here, uh, uh, translated from English to Chinese. And uh, now you have subtitles. So this is also really exciting, just more in terms of, again, you know, open education and that, that worldwide reach. And, you know, part of that, I mean, is really this idea that, um, you know, with all of these schools coming online and posting open educational resources, that, you know, anyone with the internet connection can basically be learning from the best teachers from the best schools around the world. Uh, with that, thank you very much. And here's my email if you guys have any follow-up questions. Thank <laughs> you.